Okay, so you're you're from Morristown. Yes. How long did you live there? Um, I lived there till I was about twenty twenty one. Okay. Um, and what was your what was your house like? Describe your house to me. That you grew up in. Uh, it was kind of a small two story brick house. Um, most of it being kind of a basement down below it. Um, had a couple guest rooms down in that basement area. Uh, front porch set up, a uh, small balcony on the back. Okay. And uh, talk about your, your family. You have mom, dad, brothers, sisters, anything like that? Uh, let's see. I have a mom and dad who are both in the Air Force, okay. and uh, dad worked a factory job for a number of years. Uh, he's retired and playing golf uh, as his livelihood now. Nice. Uh, mother is a band director, and... Uh, teaches at Carson Newman. Okay. Let's see, I have three half-brothers um, that are just a, a wide difference in age. Um, so I guess brothers are like 41, 43, 45, mm -hmm. uh, so a lot older. Uh, and two of them work factory jobs, and one of them is a vice president of a, of a company. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so when did you know that you were going to like go to college, go to grad school, like how did all that happen? Let's see, I knew I was going to college uh, because my mother would kind of tell me uh, that I had to. <laughs> uh, it was just expected uh, in a way, uh, especially since we were doing well enough at the time that it should work and about the time I realized I could afford college without bankrupting the family was when my mother got full time and I could get a tuition waiver. Nice. Before then it was just the federal government wouldn't pay a dime. Right. Grad school came about though uh, from one of the professors who was here a few years ago, uh, he actually uh, kind of took me under a wing and I would always talk to him and he mentioned that there's a place in North Carolina that he'd like me to check out and so his written recommendation got me into it and had fun over there and that got me into teaching at the collegiate level. Okay. Cool. Um, what was your, uh, talk to me a little bit about like, you know, you started going to school like when you were a little kid. Uh, did you have any really good friends when you were a little kid? Uh, yeah, I had a a uh, friend that we grew up, maybe there was a tiny section of woods that separated our house, but maybe a block away uh, from city standards. Uh, his name was Zach, and we would kind of hang out, or depending on how the snowfall would fall between our two areas, we'd go sledding there during the winter, and we stayed uh, good friends up until high school, so from kindergarten to then. Cool. And what did you do, like, on the weekends and stuff when you were little? What kind of games did you play? Where'd you go? Like, talk about that. Let's see, uh, I actually was lucky enough to have a pretty decent backyard, and uh, for the section that was beyond our yard, I had a very forgiving neighbor because we'd play baseball a lot in the back. We'd just play a pickup game, set out some bases, and pray to God we didn't hit a window. Um, <laughs> let's see, when we didn't have the materials for that, we'd play kickball, dodgeball, uh, just stuff like that, or we'd even go out exploring in the woods. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so when you were, when you're growing up, was there ever a time when you got like, when you got in really big trouble, like you, you broke something or like you, you thought that oh, I'm going to sneak out and I'm not, or like, I'm going to have a party and I'm not going to get caught or anything like that. Um, God, uh, so there was this one time where I was staying home alone, I suppose. And, uh, parents would be back later after dinner and I was supposed to make it for myself and I wasn't thinking clearly and I was making a small snack called Easy Mac uh, and I forgot to put water in the bowl because the dog was being really annoying and so I went out to yell at the dog started the microwave would be back in and as it turns out putting a bunch of macaroni in a plastic tub in a microwave for a long period of time starts a fire uh, so the house started filling up with smoke by the time I walked in uh, the neighbors came out and were laughing and watching. The house smelled like death. I, have, I was stupid and picked up the, the burn melted uh, like plastic tub, ran out, threw it in the trash can, which luckily had nothing in it, uh, so that maybe the evidence would be gone. Had nothing to help out with the scent, which, as again, smelled like death. Uh, and so I 
immediately started spraying Lemon Pledge, forgetting on our hardwood floor that that is a polishing uh, kind of thing. Felt hit my head, and then my dad comes in. So uh, that got me in trouble because they made fun of that and spread that uh, story to my friends as much as possible. <laughs> uh, good, good. Um, where Have you ever been kind of thinking about, like, things going wrong? Have you ever been in a situation where you were in serious danger of, like, being killed? Um, when I was in grad school, there was an uh, incident in a parking garage where uh, a guy held me up at knife point. Uh, and, uh, that, that was a little rough because it was kind of obvious he was not thinking clearly to be in a secure parking garage brandishing a knife, but also bloodshot eyes. He took a swipe, uh, I got lucky, didn't really hit anything major, kind of just a scratch at the time and got lucky after that. And, and did you think like, this is it? Like... <laughs> Honestly, I was more or less ticked because, like, I I I was really looking forward to getting home. <laughs> I was just angry more more so than anything. Yeah. It wasn't even an intelligent thought process. Like, ah, fine. You were you were inconvenienced. <laughs> yeah, it, it was like a mild inconvenience at best. <laughs> like, I understood the depth of the danger. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, okay, good. No, that's good. I like that. Okay. Um, so how do you, were you like, was it after the fact that you were like, that you got, did you get scared kind of like on the way home? You you were thinking about like, Oh my God, like, was it, um, so how did you kind of deal with like, wow, that guy like just tried to kill me? Yeah. Uh, well, I tried not to deal with it, but unfortunately, (laughs) um, uh, we were carpooling a lot in grad school. And so when they caught the guy uh, like a, like the next day and I was driving out there uh, to the parking garage, I had a couple others in there and they're like, how do you know this? I was like, oh, he tried to mug me yesterday. And then they, they legitimately uh, verbally beat me until I understood <laughs> how bad of a situation that was. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. All right. Um, so how do you... And you kind of like, you're like, oh, yeah, I guess that was like, that was kind of scary. Like, how do you, how do you process fear? Like, when you get scared, like, how do you deal with it? I mean, I guess it depends on the situation, of course. But, I mean, more often than not, um, I try to think about what, what's the simplest thing I can do uh, first. Like, if you're lost in the woods, like, you know, do you stop? Do you find water? Uh, if you're in front of someone who's trying to threaten you, I mean, can you talk to them? Can you back towards security? Do you know where help is? Yeah. Uh, and then eventually get, uh, hopefully, uh, process all those simple steps and what you can do next to the point where you can uh, leave as efficiently as possible <laughs> and as intact as possible. Yeah. So when you think of, like, when you think of being afraid of stuff, is it, like, the, like usually like physical danger, like threats to safety, or they're more like kind of existential fears <laughs> like that? <laughs> uh, f- physical danger is the, the things that, uh, that I, I guess are scary the most are the things like I can't do crap about. Like if I'm lost alone uh, in a place that I've never been to and I'm suddenly hungry or dehydrated, I, c- I don't know. I can't solve the problem immediately. I don't know what to do. Existential problems are the most terrifying, though, because you should absolutely know sometimes whether or not it's a sensible thing to be afraid of, but your mind will say no, <laughs> and you will continue to be afraid of it. Right, right. Uh, often more so. Um, have you ever met someone who's like, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like they get afraid of stuff, like they're fearless? Yeah, um, one of my older brothers is kind of like that. Right. So how how is he how is he fearless? Like what what is he? What is it that makes him seem that way? Um, I think it's almost his constant ability to not think about the situation he's in and just uh, plow through whatever is in front of him uh, as if it would not matter. Um, He he might think about it much later, but by then he solved the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you, 
Do you have a, like an active dream life? Do you dream about stuff? Uh, or do you remember your dreams? Yeah, they're they're intermittent sometimes. Yeah. Like uh, there there's like the few that I'm like I can remember, but more often than not, I, I I don't know. Okay, the ones that you can remember, what are they like? You what makes them memorable? Like the ones that stick with you. What is it? What is it about them? Uh, it's typically like what dumb concoction of events were combined in one solid moment uh, like would I really be talking to this person in this event right, or so the, like the surreal combination of circumstances yeah, uh, things that could never possibly happen right so like you're you're having dinner with Abraham Lincoln on the back of an octopus or something like that like, yeah, you're, so, like, you're like man that's weird yeah, things that make no sense. Like I'm having a casual conversation during a zombie apocalypse. Right. So, like, okay. So no, like you don't have like like pre like premonitions. Like you dream something and like it happens. I think I, I've had a few of those moments where like I've sat and I've been like, I swear I dreamt of this. So or like this is I remember this conversation or uh, that moment of like this seems familiar. Right. And like recalling like I think I had a dream about it but then never being 100% too sure. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So are you um, are you close with your with your parents? Yeah. Uh, we try to stay in, in touch as often as possible, have meals as much as we can, visit. Cool. And what do you guys, when you talk, what do you talk about? Uh, my dad typically gets into a bunch of nostalgia, and uh, he'll he'll tell me how the world used to be, and then we'll have a, a slight discussion of politics that eventually turns into an argument of politics, and and then turns into us just laughing about something else. Uh, my mother and I though end up just talking about what our daily lives like, what's going on. Uh, we'll share events. Uh, and is, uh, is someone in your family like a, like a storyteller, like who tells kind of like the family stories or like, you know, you said your dad is nostalgic. Does he like, does he talk about like back in the day, like when you were little or like, is it just about the past or is it about his father? Like, does he talk about his childhood? Uh, yeah, my dad typically has taken on that role. Before him, it was my grandfather that would tell us everyone's family history, the history of all the buildings around us. Um, some story relating to the current mayor and how he babysat him or something. You know, like, just crazy stories, and my dad's kind of taken on that role now uh, with things that seem less far-fetched because I guess I've been a little alive for more of his existence. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, and did you, you said earlier that you, you know, it was pretty clear to you early on that, like, you were going to go to college. Yes. Um, did your parents have... Do they have, like, plans for you? Be Like, do they have specific, like, you're going to be a whatever? No, they were actually fairly open. Um, so they had a couple preferences. That uh, Dad always made the joke that I don't care what letters are behind your name as long as you have a J-O-B. Um, let's see. My mother, uh, since she's more musically inclined, she'd hoped that I would, you know, stay or at least keep some kind of contact with music, and I did. Uh, through some uh, minor studies and just lessons and ensembles. But honestly, they left everything else up to me to see what I'd want to do. Cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> did you, uh, when you were little, did you go to church? Yeah, I was, uh, I was raised in the church uh, from a young age, yeah. Okay. Um, what were your, like, if you can think back, what, how did you, like, feel about church like was it yeah I loved that my aunt who I'd sit next to would occasionally bring out candy and I would be really happy on the days where we'd get to have lunch afterwards because they made a lot of really great desserts yeah. And that was my church recollection at, at a younger age. Was it, was, it was very much food-based. Like, I'd be quiet because there were lifesavers or Skittles or something. And then afterwards, I could get pie. Yeah, yeah. Who, who, who would want to go to church? Yeah. <laughs> like, I guess there were vague recollections of like, oh, okay, that, that guy did another nice thing. Cool. Mm -hmm. I like it. Um, and what, uh, what denomination did you grow up in? Uh, I grew up a Methodist. Okay. 
And did you go to church every Sunday? Uh, when I was little, yes. Okay. Um, and did you, when you went to church, did you, you know, when you were little, obviously it was food-based church, um, <laughs> did you, like, were you able to interact at all with, like, the, the pastor or, like, with, with members of kind of, like, the, I guess, like, the establishment? Like, were, were, you, were you involved in the church or did you go to church? A lot of the people who uh, would be, I guess, a part of that whole establishment were still uh, there. Like, you'd talk to the pastor once in a while. That He'd come in and teach uh, the Sunday school that all the kids would go to. Uh, the youth pastor would be uh, another uh, member of the board doing a couple other things, and he'd still be teaching, like, you know, the uh, the children's lesson or whatever. And, you know, they'd, they'd all pop in or drop in or they'd all take... Um, multiple jobs and so that's how we got to know them in some way okay um and when when did you like when did you stop thinking of church as there's delicious pie at church and start thinking of it as something different than that (laughs) i guess uh when i was around maybe nine or ten and then you know um the studies got more serious. Uh, the Methodist Church kind of pushed you into going into like confirmation. Yeah. And uh, you know, there are more rigorous lessons. You met with the pastor more. Um, it wasn't simply like an arts and crafts based economy of learning. You had to go into like actually studying, remembering things. You'd have to like explicate a, por- a part of the Bible or something. Uh, so I guess later elementary school was when. I guess it became more of a thought process. Mm-hmm. All right. And when did you, like, how did, I guess, let me, I'm trying to think of how to, like, phrase this question. When did, when did getting lifesavers and eating pie and doing homework become, like, a religious experience? Like, <laughs> I guess when they actually took it out of the church for the first couple times, like, they'd get us involved in things that made more practical sense uh, or it felt like you were doing something like I mean I've always liked music uh, too so that always helped that I was able to study and like make something that sounded beautiful or do something that truly felt right Um, but like we'd go deliver food to um, like people who were disenfranchised or couldn't help in the community like people who weren't even part of the church and that felt really cool to me uh, that we could do that and you know so as soon as i was old enough to like hoist a turkey up around thanksgiving and like carry that up to someone's doorstep i could do it and would stay and would make food uh or even helping for like vacation bible school being like old enough to to help teach a younger kid that felt like an actual religious experience okay cool um you uh you live in knoxville now yes um are you like are you in the city or are you just in the county like where where are you um, I'm right off of the city, uh, so I mean, I, I guess technically it would still be considered a part of West Knoxville. Okay. Like we're right outside of it. Uh, it doesn't seem like a city from the portion where we drive through. Okay. We're, we're adjacent to everything. Okay, <laughs> adjacent to everything. I like it. It's kind of how Knoxville structured. Um, yeah. So, are you are you at all involved in like local politics, that kind of thing? Like, you vote in like city council stuff? Are you like are you an engaged citizen? Uh, as often as I can be, I'm an engaged citizen. Um, I'm in a part of a, of, um, a social justice um, movement because of a friend of mine who's heading it. And so it's uh, the Knoxville Social Justice uh, Group. And I occasionally I, I make an appearance at the meetings or, you know, voice a couple of appearances, um, go to some of the marches if I can make it uh, outside of work or other prior commitments. Uh, voting on the city level stuff has been difficult though uh, getting used to the politics but I try to be as engaged as a, of a citizen as possible okay. why is that important to you? because even if it doesn't feel like you're making some kind of change more often than not uh, it's about the only way you can try to make one uh, is to actually get up and do the things that seem more difficult or time consuming right. and uh you said your your friend runs this Knoxville Social Justice Group. What are what are the kind of things they do? What do they advocate for specifically? Right now, there's been a large push to 
kind of bring better recognition to the drug epidemic and, you know, helping out family members and finding better ways to do that. Uh, for a time period, it was trying to help create an enforcement measurement uh, for law enforcement that might uh, occasionally step over a bound or, or two. And I think the, uh, the newest push is trying to get rid of the like amount of money, like you had to pay a fine to be able to visit a family member in jail. Mm -hmm. And so getting that away as being unethical and un-American mm -hmm. uh, has been a the most recent and I think one of the strongest pushes so far. Okay, cool. Um, we're going to switch gears mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so you grew up in, Nor in Morristown. Yeah. Um, your, your parents are fairly well educated, right? Yeah. Did they both go to college? Uh, mother went to college, got her master's degree as well, and started her doctorate. Uh, dad went to college, did well, but felt like it wasn't for him and went in the military. Okay. And where are your, where are your mom and dad from? Uh, let's see. My mother is from a, a small town called Dublin, Maryland. Uh -huh. And dad actually grew up in Morristown, Tennessee as well. Okay. Um, did you notice when you were growing up, like, differences in the way that people talked? Like, the people sounded different from you, from each other? Uh, yeah. Uh, so whenever I would visit my relatives in Maryland, they had a slightly different tone overall. Um, they would pronounce a few words uh, maybe slightly differently. Uh, but more often than that, they would point out that I sound incredibly different uh, or that I have uh, an accent. And um, so I'd, I'd, I'd recognize it too, I guess, around where I lived. Like some people would have, I guess, more of a deeper southern accent mm -hmm. than I, I might or the way they pronounce a word would have an actual twang to it. Right. Um, have you ever tried to change the way that you talk? For any reason? Absolutely. Okay. Um, again, part of it was like the relatives up north made me feel really bad about my accent. And so I actually made a concentrated effort sometimes to, and sometimes it happens when I'm teaching or speaking in public. Um, I'll change my voice to be a little bit more like this and actually accentuate every single term and phrase. Your, your newscaster speak. Yeah, I, I go Midwestern newscaster as much as possible. Right. And so... Uh, and did anyone, like you said, you, your, your relatives in, yeah. in Maryland made you kind of feel bad about your accent. Has anyone, like, kind of pointed out explicitly, like, who who has, like, brought attention to the way that you talk that you can recall? Uh, my aunt uh, once in, in a while would, uh, would bring it up. Um, my, girl, my girlfriend at one point uh, brought up an interesting fact about, like, a speech pattern that I couldn't do too well. Um, or just how I would say a word. Um, it was mostly relatives, uh, occasional friends uh, while I was in grad school because they, they, my accent seemed slightly different than theirs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there any? Is there anything that people like? Is there anything in the way that other people talk where you're kind of like, like that, like kind of is cringy or like gets on your nerves? Um, <clears throat> I really. Ah, man, I guess I, I don't like some of the, like the the millennial speak that I'll have. I, like I hate abbreviations said out loud. Like whenever if someone actually says "lol" out loud and like as a response, I get mad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like there's a visible disdain that'll appear. Uh, let's see, people that overuse or like almost seem to personally try and add more of a southern accent to words. Mm -hmm. Almost needlessly, that used to get on my nerves quite a lot. Like when they would just throw y'all out as often as possible. And why did that get on your nerves? Because it... and it seemed like it always, uh, it almost always perpetuated a stereotype like uh, of ignorance or a general lack of education as a populace. And like, but it was like they were doing it on purpose, like they're making fun of people. Yeah, like when they're at a football game or something, mm -hmm. uh, like um, the heck the. Uh, what is it? The it's not it's not the GBO uh, it's not the GBO uh, y'all or something for the Go Big Orange, uh, but it was something where they'd always just say y'all and like it would they would just make it's a caricature. Oh yeah, yeah. football y'all, and then they'd throw that in yeah. as hard as possible. Like that's not how you actually talk. 
Yeah, there we go. You had it. Yeah, there it is. Um, <laughs> like that would just uh, it would annoy me because like the, none of those interpretations sound like someone that you want to have a conversation with. <laughs> It's someone you order mm-hmm. deer jerky from. Right, deer jerky. Have you ever ordered deer jerky? From it's someone? delicious. Yeah. Zach, uh, the guy I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. uh, his, his dad actually would go out and hunt deer, and I loved it. It was amazing. Yeah, deer jerky's good stuff. All right, um, and <clears throat> so when you when you go and you get your deer jerky... Of course. Do you find yourself kind of sounding more like you're from Morristown than you went to graduate school in Knoxville? You went to grad school at UT, right? Uh, I went to grad school at Western Carolina. Oh, Western Carolina. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so do you do you find yourself like kind of dropping your I have a Master of Arts kind of uh, persona when you go and you order your deer jerky? Uh, absolutely. Even when I was working for uh, a little while um, before I got a teaching job, I would simply go into like this good old boy system. Just relaxed uh, manner of speech. Heck, uh, even introduced words I would never use in casual speech because it was more effective at getting a deal or, co- or having a conversation working. What what kind of like what would you do? Give me some examples of like things. That... Um, I don't think in regular speech I would ever say "nah, man," but like eventually, be like "nah, man, I can do this." Absolutely, you know, just uh, seeming more agreeable, uh, jumping down into it. Uh, uh, I would use uh, <laughs> religious epithets or, or, or like small phrases. <laughs> uh, Lord bless it would come out a lot more. Uh, I, I even remember it like at one point because I, I, I even knew it was like a highly religious uh, like group. Like it was just almost a stereotype in of itself of like the Bible Belt just dropping in like, you know, Lord willing, I'd be able to get through this. And I'd never say that outside of it. It was just an easier way to get through speech. Okay. All right. I like it. That's that's excellent. All right, there's one more, there's one more thing I want you to do. Um, I want you to read the words on those lists, and you don't have to say word list one and word list two. Just read the words. Just in order. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Fill. Pen. Oil. Hollow. Fish bait. Wash. Help. Feel. Potato. Life. Pen. Thorough. Feel. Follow, get, red, old lace, fire, fail, home, hit, wire, feet, doing, okra, greasy, mining, tobacco, fell, lice. Lot, thought, prize, boil. Poor, pen, choice, toll, ball, poor, trap, dress, cub, thing, thought, test, hand, nothing, this, morning, often, trimmed, clasp, cost, risk, story, Ask, toe, fault, grasp. All right. Thank you.